Okay. Welcome to Spine Conference. Today's um, topic, let me get it there. Okay, today's topic is uh, lumbar stenosis and scoliosis. So, um, this is, uh, I like to do case based learning because, um, and you were in on this, Madeline, too, so you remember it. Uh, it's nice because you never forget a case that you've seen. So it's a 72-year-old woman with right sciatica. So her history is she's had pain for many, many years, and you're going to see that with all the x-rays and MRIs. And she's referred by pain management. And her pain's in the posterior thigh, anterior thigh, and lateral leg. She has similar symptoms on the left, but the right is much, much worse than the left. And pain in the posterior thigh and posterior leg, what, what nerve roots... What do you think, Madeline? What nerve roots would you think? Yeah, exactly. L5. So it goes, and typically it goes to the lateral malleolus. So I always take, tell people to take one finger, show me where it goes, lateral malleolus, lateral leg is L5. S1 is usually posterior leg, like posterior calf to the Achilles tendon. S1 goes to the lateral border of the foot. L5 usually goes to the dorsum of the foot. L4 typically goes lateral thigh to the anterior knee to the medial leg, sometimes medial malleolus. L3 is the anterior thigh. L2 is medial thigh. L1 is groin. So I know you. Know, it's hard to memorize it when you don't do it, but for for me, this, I do this all day, so it's just it's just easy. So her past medical history, she had a laminectomy in 2008, so that was uh, what, 14 years ago. She says it was very difficult rehab for a month. She's had an ACDF, uh, anterior posterior resection, colostomy for rectal carcinoma in 2009, discoid limp, lupus, obstruction, surgery in the past, depression. She takes Cymbalta, Bilify, Plaquenil, Amlodipine, Neurontin, Miralax, and Meprazole, and Hydrocodone 10 three times a day. She quit cigarettes in 2018, uh, but I think she still smokes a little bit. And uh, she's actually um, a small uh, size statured person, five feet tall, 145 pounds, and neurologically intact. But what do you think of the... Um, X-ray there on the left. Um, Aiden, what do you think of the lumbar spine? Does it look normal? Uh, it doesn't look normal. Um, I see a cob angle there. Yeah, so it's a cob angle, which means there's a scoliosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so typically it's straight, right? And her cob angle is almost 60, so it's, it's pretty high. So let's keep going. So, and if you guys have questions, just interrupt me. Okay, so go back to 2008 now she had a 38 degree curve which is much less it's like almost what 20 degree 20 degree uh, increase and the lateral view looks reasonably normal and typically this lumbar spine is totally straight up and down right the spine when you look at it on the ap view is totally straight so here's the mri from 2008 and on the lateral view, you can see it doesn't look right. The squares are asymmetric. And tell me, guys, why is that? Why on the on this coronal on the sagittal section, the the verbal bodies are asymmetric? Because on the AP view, there's a scoliosis, right? Mm -hmm. So when you slice it, those are out of plane. So that's why it looks like that. So these are the axial views. Here's the spinal canal. And Aiden, what do you think of this spinal canal right here? Big, small, normal, tiny. L1, L2. Oh, you can't. You can't see, you can't see my pointer. Yeah, L1, L2. Um, I'd say. Yeah, see little dots with the little dots inside the uh, circle. Let me show you. Yeah. That's a spot for now. What are those little dots within the spot for now? What lives in the spinal canal in the spine? Okay. Yeah, spinal cord and the nerves. So those are all nerve roots. And, and that, just so you see L1, L2, that's a normal spinal canal. And then you can see all the different sections. The other thing, interesting thing is to the right of L1, L2, you can see how the posterior spinous process is rotated 20, uh, 27 degrees from the vertical. So... Uh, it corresponds to her scoliosis as well. So scoliosis is a rotatory deformity. It's not only in the front view, but the whole thing twists. That's why Madeline, when we do these surgeries, I don't know if you remember, but sometimes it's like it's off, and I always ask the table to be rotated. So it's it's a rotatory deformity. 
So we'll keep going down L2, L3. Spinal canal gets somewhat smaller, doesn't it? L3, L4. What do you think L4, L5, uh, Madeline? What do you think of the uh, spinal canal? Pretty severe, yeah. And then five ones open. Now, I want you, I want you to take um, particular view, and I think this is very interesting, of the facets. So this, this is the facet right here, see that? And you see how it kind of looks like a hamburger? Um, and look at all these facets, they all look pretty similar. Look at the five one facet, see how it's so much larger? It's hypertrophic. So let's just, just keep that in mind, because I, th I think I'm gonna show you something later. And so this is 2008, 2000, I don't know why I put this in 2014. Uh, okay, we'll just keep going. Yeah, now she had surgery in 2008, remember? L4 laminectomy. So just keep that in your mind. Now she has another MRI in 2014. And why, she, why does she have another MRI? Why do people get MRIs in the first place? Not for fun, right? Did you Something, yeah, the patient's symptomatic. So she's not doing well. I mean, so patients, patients don't get MRIs um, unless they have symptoms. So something's wrong with her. So she had an MRI in 2014 and L405, which is right there, is sliding a little bit. Now look at the axial cuts. I, I, this is kind of interesting. And I don't understand this fully. There's a progression here that's weird. L1, L2 spinal canal looks good. L2, L3 slightly small. L3, L4 is much smaller, isn't it, compared to here? L3, L4 in 2008. And by 2014, L3, L4 has gotten more stenotic. Look at the 4 5 facet. It's re they're really big and irregular. Can, can you guys see that? Yeah. It's kind of bizarre, isn't it? Very hypertrophic, very irregular. It hardly even looks like a joint. Doesn't it, yeah, it doesn't even look like a joint anymore. It's bizarre. And then the L5-S1 facets are, are big, but still, but no real change. Okay, so here are the x-rays in 2015. Um, not great quality, but L4, L5 now has some spondylolisthesis. See how the bones are sliding a little bit forwards there? And the scoliosis has gotten so much worse. Now it's 52 degrees in 2015. Now here's another MRI in 2016. Again, why do people get MRIs? It's like patient symptomatic, you know? So let's keep looking at everything. L2, L3 spinal canal looks pretty good. L1, L2 is normal. 3, 4 is even more stenotic. Now look at 4, 5 facets. Totally different, right? They, they're not as big, and it looks like the left one, it looks like it's going on to fuse, doesn't it? Doesn't like, you see the one on the, the right facet? Again, it's, you know, it's backwards how MRIs work. The right facet, you can see that black line going across it. See that black line on the right facet? So that's a normal looking facet. On the left, you don't see that black line. So I think this patient went on to autofuse. F4-5, the facet. Uh, yeah, or or remember she has uh, uh, an inflammatory uh, spondyloarthropathy. What was her disease again? It's discoid lupus. Mm -hmm. So she's fusing her spine. It's weird, isn't it? It's interesting. Uh, so it must have kicked off some kind of process that went on to fuse it. And then the five-month facets are hypertrophic as well. It's 2016. Keep going. Um... 2017. Why? Well, they're all inflammatory spondyloarthropathies, mm -hmm. so they manifest themselves differently, but they're they're similar. They're like the you know, autoimmune disease, and you can get when you have autoimmune diseases, you can fuse your spine. Normal people can fuse your spine too, and we don't understand it, but it's very common, like rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory arthropathies. They can go on to fuse their spine. I don't. Know, I find it interesting. Now again, 2017. Again, why? Why is um, why do people? Why does she keep getting these MRIs? Can you just let's, let's guess? I don't know, but I'm just guessing. One is your over 50 
with a kind of red flag going on. And another is if you've had traumatic back injury. Another is if you have IV drug use history. Yeah, red flags. Yeah, so you have back pain, IV drug abuse, fever, and uh, uh, loss of bowel bladder. Loss of bowel bladder, yeah. Quadriquina syndrome, and out of control pain, like pain, like patients can't move. That's good. So, and three, four, look, three, four now is very stenotic. So, what I think what is going on is um, they don't know what to do with her, basically, because. They keep getting these MRIs because she's still symptomatic. She's getting worse. There's no surgery being done. I think it's because not a straightforward problem. I think this is what's going on. And then that's why I'm showing her on the spine conference because she's not a straightforward problem. Okay. So again, another MRI a year later, 2018. Kind of the same thing. Everything's the same. L1, L2 is normal. L2, L3 is still open. L3, L4 now is super stenotic, like really stenotic. Uh, that's not four or five. I, I, I wrote that wrong. That's three, four. And then four or five on the bottom left is open. Looks like it's fused. It hasn't changed. And five, one looks about the same. Yeah. Well, hold on. Hold your horses. She had surgery in 2008. And then the next one's 2014. So she was good for six years, which is a long time. It's getting bigger. Uh, usually the, the the number is usually fifty, but you're close. You're close. Yeah, it's getting bigger. See, it's fifty-two. You're right. It's getting bigger. Okay, so where were we? 2018. 2018. Were we? Yeah. And then uh, now 21. Now the comic is 58. So that curve is getting bigger. Left T11 to L4. And um, when you evaluate scoliosis, you want to get an AP view of the entire spine because then you can see uh, all the different curves of the spine and, and they're kind of important. And you can see she's got one big major curve in the lumbar spine. Yeah, it's a big one. It's uh, 60 degrees, left T10 to L4. And then she also has a compensatory one above it. And the, the actually, yeah, it's probably compensatory. It looks bigger, but it measures the bigger one. The the thoracic is is uh, higher magnitude. Uh, I'm not sure which one came first. I think probably the lower one. And she's also she's also listing. She's also uh, towards the right. You see, if you drop a line from her head, it's a little bit to the right of her, the middle of her pelvis. So she's a little bit uh, deformed. So now, now November 2022, which is now. So she's 59 degrees and she has increased 21 degrees over 14 years. And scoliosis, do you guys know how much it usually progresses? So in children, it progresses really fast. So if the child has growth left, um, it progresses really fast. In adults, it's usually one or two degrees a year. So she's about, about what they usually do, one or two degrees degrees a year after you get a certain 50 degrees. So after you hit 50, you you keep progressing usually, which is what she has done. Um, so here's the most recent MRI, October 2022. And um, it's kind of interesting how things evolved. L1, L2 is again normal. L2, L3 is not so bad. 3, 4 is really bad. See how there's no area for the nerves at 3, 4? And four five kind of looks the same. And it looks like the set on the left is still auto fused, and five one looks kind of the same. So it's kind of a it's kind of an interesting evolution, isn't it? Like I've never seen this before. I've never had someone who had disease, and I looked at the MRIs every year and how they evolved. Because in this in this one in two thousand hold on in two thousand eight I don't know L two L two or three was kind of stenotic, not terrible. And three four was kind of normal. And four five, and then it kind of evolved over time. Where three four now three four is really the bad player is very stenotic, and two three is not too bad. Okay, so any questions? Here's a turkey. Is there any questions so far? Okay, so let's go over uh, scoliosis, and if you have any questions, interrupt me. Okay, so there's different types of scoliosis. You can be born with it. 
When you're born with it, congenital is usually a failure of segmentation or formation. So the x-ray on the left is a failure of, of formation. He's got it. See how he's got a little extra vertebra there in the middle? And so on the left side, he has part, half the vertebra. On the right, it never formed. And it causes a very sharp focal curve that you've got to fix this. You can't, you can't sit on this because it will grow very, very quickly. Uh, or it doesn't segment. Uh, you have these bars that are, are like a tether. And the one that doesn't have the bar grows really grows a lot. And the, and the one that is fused doesn't grow. So that's another reason it grows very quickly. So congenital scoliosis is a totally different animal. And then you have adolescent idiopathic scol uh, uh, scoliosis, which you see this child at the age of 10 was sort of normal, but then by 14, it's got a very large curve. And boys, just a rule of thumb, um, boys grow slowly until they're 21. Usually they stop growth. You basketball fan, Aiden? I watched the NBA. But, uh, just NBA. Okay, you're not a college fan. So when you're a college fan, you'll notice that the freshmen, they actually get taller. So you get a freshman that was six foot three, and when they're seniors, they're six foot six. Some kids grow in college, some boys, some boys do. So boys can continue to grow until they're like 21. Girls stop growth usually around uh, two years after cessation of their, uh, when two years after they start menstruating. So girls ballpark, they stop growing around 15. Um, but the menstruation age has gone down for some reason over time. So now most girls, I know you guys don't probably do two peds. I know this because I used to do peds. So this was very important. Most girls now menstruate around 11. You have to know because that's when the girls grow. Gr girls grow really fast three year period around their uh, uh, beginning of their menstruation period. So they grow really fast and then they're done their growth. Um, my boys grow for a long period of time. But that's important for me. Only only reason I know this is because I'm, I I um, evaluate scoliosis, and you know if the child has not started menstruating, already has a curve, that girl is going to get a very big curve. So it's like a sort of like a dangerous sign. So um, and you can assess growth by uh, the iliac crest. You can see uh, the physis starts um, uh, on the left on the lateral, and it creeps immediately, and then it fuses. So that usually is it's a sign of um, uh, um, adolescent when they're stage five, they're fused, they're probably not going to grow. And you can also uh, take an x-ray of a children's hand and there's particular growth plates that they've documented with the Grulich Pile Atlas. You can just buy the atlas and you can tell the uh, bone age of the child because some children um, uh, grow uh, not chronologically, but differently. So, so the, you can have a 12 year old that's immature or mature, you know, either way, and the bone age will help you. So this is just a, uh, how do you measure the Cobb angle? So the Cobb angle is you measure the, uh, the end vertebras top and bottom by the, by the bone that's angled most. So can you see that house cut that is top and bottom, the angled the most. And then the apex is the vertebral body that's the farthest from the midline. So, and then the, you guys know the planes. There's a sagittal plane, the frontal plane, or I call it coronal, and the transverse plane or axial plane. I call it sagittal. I don't know why, but I call it sagittal, coronal, uh, or axial. And then another important thing in deformity is lateral lysthesis. You see how the those bones have lysthesis? They're sliding in the coronal plane. So any questions about scoliosis? Also some maneuvers, maneuvers about physical exam. Um, that I am familiar with the maneuver, but I'm not familiar with the name. That's okay. Just what is it? We're looking at the hip with the, the, the feeling for kind of the equalness of the hips. Yeah. Um, so you put your hands. Also, also allowing them to bend. Bend forwards, bend bend forwards right. Forwards. So, yeah. Yeah. So when you see a child for a deformity, you put your hands on the top of their hips, the top of the pelvis, and you do that to see if they have a leg length discrepancy. Mm -hmm. So if one leg's long than the other, you can see that one hip pelvis is taller than the other. So that's that's a very good thing to do with children because that's a, that's important if they have leg length discrepancy, especially when they're very small, 
you should probably do something about it. And you can, you can knock the growth out of a growth plate in the leg. Uh, and then they even out. You basically make, you stop, you stop the growth in the stronger leg, which a lot of parents don't want you to do, but it's probably worth it for the child because then their pelvis becomes balanced and they don't develop scoliosis. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Because, because then the, like the base of your body, your pelvis is crooked. So then nobody wants to walk crooked. So this, the spine curves naturally. That's true. And then when you bend forwards, you can see the, the rotatory deformity of the spine. The spine was rotated. So the ribs are, you can see the ribs are rotated a little bit higher. So it's good. Okay. So I'm just going to keep going. Just the, the first documentation of stenosis was from Verbeest, where he wrote some articles about stenosis of the spinal canal, which is called symptoms. So here's my old secretary from long ago. You see, she, take, she took the spine and you, she's looking down the spinal canal and there's an area for the nerves. And at each vertebral body bone, there's a hole, a foramen, where a nerve comes out, the pens in a foramen. So this is optimal anatomy. This is a normal MRI. Uh, and you can see the, the white parts, the CSF, the spinal canal. And, and I'm gonna go through axial cuts of every level. Look at this, you see the spinal canal. I'll just make sure. We'll look at the same thing. Yep, see little dots. You can't really see the nerves here. It's not a good MRI, but you can see the spinal canal. So now we're going to creep up L5, S1, L4, L5, L3, L4, L2, L3, L1, L2, T12, L1. See that they're very symmetric? T11, T12. Then the thoracic canal gets somewhat smaller. So th this, is <laughs> this is how it should look like optimally. Um, probably, <laughs> I would probably say like 80% of people. Uh, just because you're not, well, the problem is some canals are small and then these are the, these are what the canals look like. If you take, if you can magically remove them from someone's body, uh, their shape, uh, and at the shape at different levels. So it's, in, you have to know what's normal. This came from a French textbook that's out of print like uh, 50 years ago. And um, yeah, so um, part, parts of the spine is um, this is shows between the vertebral bodies is the ligament and flavum, uh, which connects the bones and it can hypertrophy and compress the nerve roots. And the spine uh, moves and it moves a lot through the facets. You see the facet joint and you see the, the capsule. Um, and we saw that yesterday. Remember you were looking at the capsule, the fibrous capsule. So when people have spinal stenosis, they usually have low back pain and pain running down the legs. But what other things can cause pain running down your leg? The patient says, I have leg pain when I walk. Yeah. Yeah, disc herniations cause it, but also your vascular claudication can give you pain down the leg. So you have to assess that. So on the top right, I mean, that's somebody who has serious vascular claudication. You can see they're dead, but sometimes they just say I have pain uh, when I walk. What, do you know what, Madeline, what other things they say when they have vascular claudication? Yeah, when they stop, they say I walk and then I stop and it totally goes away. Usually spinal stenosis patients don't say that. Also, if they get on uh, if they get on a bicycle, they hurt. But a spinal stenosis patient does not get pain when they get on a bicycle. But I mean, most older people don't get on bicycle. Yeah, yeah, they open the spinal canal. Right, exactly. I'm glad you said that because when you lean backwards, it gets worse because the ligament flavum buckles. And yeah, exactly, exactly. Shopping cart syndrome because people uh, they want to bend forwards, and when they walk, so when they're in the grocery store, they're walking bent forward and they're leaning on the shopping cart. And, and the reason why we know that shopping cart is that's, that's probably why it's kind of like a watering hole for animals. It's like we all go to the grocery store. So you see all the old people. Yeah, yeah, because that's where, yeah, because you don't see a lot of old people normally unless you go like to church or something. You usually have like one or two old people in your life when you're young. When you're my age, you have a lot more old people in your, in your life because I'm old. But you know what I'm saying? So that's why you see them in the grocery store. And a typical... Uh, Transverse diameter, uh, anterior or posterior diameter is about 15, 17 millimeters as for a number. And obviously people vary. 
and I won't get into that. So the, the typical treatment for stenosis is rest, uh, steroids like that dude, um, but not those types of steroids. Uh, not to run anti-inflammatory drugs like Aleve or Motrin, um, muscle relaxers, uh, and um, amitriptyline. You basically want to calm down the patient's symptoms when you see them. NSAIDs work very well, but they can cause GI bleeds, renal failure, worse hypertension. Uh, there's some uh, risks of heart attacks and bleeding. Physical therapy is an option. And I won't get into this. Injections are an option. So the, the surgical treatment for stenosis, the spinal canal is small. The old school or typical is laminectomy, where you remove the whole lamina. Can you see that? So the whole, the whole lamina is removed. It opens it widely, but that kind of weakens the spine. See how that, that's like a laminectomy. Now, this is um, my former partner, Charles Edwards, who taught me in 2000, and they, he published it in 2002. Actually, his former fellow published in 2002 was a, 2000 was porthole technique, technique where you just drill a hole and leave the posterior spinous processes and some of the lamina intact. So this is, he published this in 2000 in spine, uh, porthole technique. And I, I, I uh, that's what I, in 2000, I started at University of Maryland with uh, Chuck Edwards in 99. And we used to do these porthole techniques and it works really well. Uh, and it doesn't destabilize the spine. And it's kind of evolved, the portal technique has evolved into uh, the ULBT, ULBD technique, unilateral laminotomy bilateral decompression. And I just started doing this myself as well because I one time I just was able to do it just from a ipsilateral approach. And then I started doing it more and more. And uh, I thought I was the only one in the world doing it, but it, it's, it was, uh, it was um, then I researched it. It was definitely, it, it basically people evolved into doing it because the microscopes got better. So everyone started doing it, these techniques similarly. Uh, and people called it unilateral laminectomy bilateral decompression. The first article I found was uh, from Germany. So I just want to go over just the, what my technique, and I showed this to Mount yesterday's. You see the posterior spinous process. I always do this step first because some people have a, crook a crooked posterior spinous process. The thing actually is over the lamina, and it completely blocks your view. So you should always shave it down to open your view up. So I shave down the posterior spinous process. I usually remove about half of it. And I get down the lamina and then you always want to keep the pars intact um, because if you, if you fracture the pars, you get instability. The pars, the pars means a uh, place between the pars interarticularis means a place between the two joints and the pars in this case is right there. So you want, if you, if you, if you get too close to the pars, it can fracture and then you have a big problem. So basically you need an opening about 12 millimeters um, and that's three burr uh, lengths because the burr is three millimeters, the one that I use. So I kind of like count three burrs over from my cut in the, posterior, in the posterior spinous process and that's where I make my first cut. And then I connect it midline and then I remove the middle part, connect two areas. So here's uh, the axial view you get down close to the dura, but there's ligament and flavum there that protects your dura. And usually it's hypertrophic, so you're not that close to the dura really. Uh, and then you start, you find the dura at the very top and I actually go laterally first because it's all protected by ligament and flavum. I, I didn't write that in this cartoon because I've kind of changed my technique a little bit. And um, you remove the ligament protects you and then you remove the whole ligament and then you tilt the table and then you drill a little bit on the other side through this window and there's still ligament there protecting you somewhat. And then you remove the ligament and you open the spinal canal from a very small window. And I on purpose use these plastic suction tips because I can retract with it. And the other, the other benefit of the plastic suction tip is I push gently, obviously, with the, with the suction tip with my one hand and I'm using the kerosene with the other. I am a control freak, but I do it for a reason. It's not only like control freak reasons, but I can feel the dura. So if I pull with the kerosene, malin, I can feel the dura move with my left hand. That's why I do it myself. Mm -hmm. And if, you, if you're pulling on the dura, you know you don't want to cause a dural tear, so you stop. And that's why you notice sometimes I stop and I was like, that, that doesn't feel right. And I can, I can feel that there's a connection somewhere. And there's usually like a scar or a, a dentate ligament that's the, the dura is connected to the ligament and flavum. Uh, 
Fraser. Right. The, right. The let me show you a Fraser. A Fraser is. Yeah, a Fraser is the metal ones we usually use. That's a Fraser tip. Uh, yeah, when I'm in the lumbar spine, because I can manipulate the nerve roots, but when I'm in the um, cervical and thoracic spine, I cannot manipulate the thecal sac because you're at level of the spinal cord, you can injure the spinal cord. I use the Frasers because they're just, they're really good. They're small, they're, they work very well. But in the lumbar spine, because I'm, I'm manipulating the nerve roots, I can use the plastic ones. You can read about this this technique. It was um, I found it in 2017. This is I think this is the first surgical technique that was published in the Chinese uh, Orthopedic Association. The technique's not common in the United States for some reason. And, and then the question is, which side to approach? Do you do it on the left side? Do you, do you do it on the right side? If the symptoms are are the symptoms are uh, asymmetric, I usually do the left because I'm right-handed. But I usually go to the side of the symptoms. So the patient goes, my right leg hurts more than my left leg, then I do the right side to sure to make sure that it's open. It's in the prone position. This is, you probably you guys never seen it. This is the Andrews frame. Uh, and it opens up the spinal canal, but it's really difficult to uh, to get this just right. It's a real hassle. And uh, if you have a long case, you can get a compartment syndrome of the legs um, with this table. And then this, the Jackson table came out like, I mean, I want to say like 95 or something, and it's evolved many times. And uh, it's a prone table. You see there's holes uh, for the belly. And I remember the first time I used it was in 99. I was at the University of Maryland. I did a discectomy on a pregnant woman. And I said, you know, the only way I can do this is with the Jackson table because the belly was, um, the belly was free from the pregnancy. And there was a nurse underneath monitoring the heart rate of the baby while I was doing a discectomy. It was really nerve wracking. And then I, I was like, I kind of got turned on to the Jackson table after I used it because it was so helpful. And then now the second generation also bends a lot easier. And this is me on the Jackson table. You can see how it um, it fits. And you use a C arm to know where you are and the microscope. And here what it looks like when you use a microscope. And uh, I won't get into this. This just shows you how, how, how the decompression is seen. A lot of I'm not allowed decompression. And this is an Australian neurosurgeon who um, published an article in 2014 about the results. I, I won't get into this. But the, the, the pitfalls from the unilateral you know, amnactic biological decompression is it's technically more difficult. I mean, you can always get a dural tear, a nerve injury. And let me just show you. You can break it. Yeah, you can break it. Have you guys seen, have I showed this to you? Rendition. I know it's an artist rendition. I know. Just on one side. They did the tilt opposite. You tilt the other way.
That's it. Tau the Towson arts art students made that. Yeah. As the, as the technique becomes more mainstream, or more. Um, it'll never. It'll never be mainstream. It'll never. Okay. Do you mm. do you find that it's difficult to find like the, the exact correct instruments for what you need, or? Is no, no one. It's never going to be popular because you don't pay. You don't get paid any more for it. And it's difficult. So no one's ever going to do it. This is just the people who have interest in it. Now, unfortunately, that's how the world works. The people are are incentivized, and that's how behavior behaviors follow incentives. Financial usually. So, so the ligament and flavum usually is the um, offending um, problem. We talked about suction tips. We talked about Frazier's high speed drill. That's a high speed drill for a car. It looks like, almost like what we use, right, Madeline? Yeah. Here's our burr tip. It's a three millimeter acorn shaped burr tip. They used to be powered by by uh, uh, um, pressured gas, but now it's all electrical. It's really smooth. Okay, so back to our patient. So the problem is, is she has right terrible right sciatica. She has a big curve. Uh, L3, L4 is subluxated. L3, L4 is the worst level for stenosis, very, very severe. She's had previous L4 laminectomy. She's L4, L5 spondylolisthesis. She's 72, which is not super old, but yeah, not young. Um, she has lupus, depression, smoking. So there's a lot of problems. So what, do you, does anybody do, I, I'll tell you what my, my um, options were for this patient. Does anybody want to take a stab at it? What's the best surgery? What do you think, Madeline? Or you want me to just go on? Well, good. Yeah. yeah. Just the decompression, yeah. So what happened is the day before I went over this, and I spent about two hours thinking about it. And I thought to myself, the, the initial plan <clears throat> was a decompression L304, L405 with a fusion L3 to L5. And the reason I chose those is because L3, L4 is subluxating. It's very stenotic. Uh, uh, it's in the curve. So I think it's high risk for instability. And I included L4, L5 because that level is spondylolisthesis as well. So I thought that would be high risk for getting worse. But when I made that initial decision, I didn't realize that 4, 5 was autofused because it just, I didn't look carefully enough at it. So I don't think 4, 5 is going to move anymore. Um, and then the other problem is when you fuse from L3 to L5, you're not fusing the whole curve. So what happens is if you only fuse a little bit of the curve, the rest of the curve deteriorates very quickly. Yeah, on the other levels, yeah. Even though L2, L3 doesn't have severe stenosis, it probably will deteriorate quickly if you fuse it. So then I was thinking, oh, maybe that's not a good idea. And then I thought, well, maybe I'll just fuse the whole curve. Now we're talking T12 or... Was it T10 to L5? That's a big surgery for this person. She's got a lot of risk factors, medical risk factors, which uh, 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 predispose her for a poor outcome. You know? Exactly, yeah. The L4 line next year, she had a really hard time. I was like, oh, wow, now we're going to do this really big surgery. And then not only that, she has a curve above it. So then there's going to be a lot of stress on that curve. And now what do you do, a T3 to L5 fusion? And now it's a massive surgery. So the night before, um, I called her and I was like, I'm changing the plan. And I left a message and she didn't answer. And then I talked to her in the morning. She was upset about it that I changed the plan. But I had to do what I thought was right. And, and sometimes you have to change the plan if you, if, if, when you think about things. So she was okay with it. So we did the, so this is just my, we just did, a, like Madeline said, we just did a decompression at 3-4, you know, <clears throat> a right-sided, because she had mostly right-sided, a unilateral laminotomy, unilateral laminotomy, bilateral decompression. And this is, after every surgery, I draw exactly what I did um, in my logbook. Uh, and this is, this is uh, there was a lot of scar, you can see. It, it, took us, uh, it took us two hours, 20 minutes. It was difficult because there was a lot of scar. Yeah, rotated, deformed, yeah. Blood loss of 50 cc's, which is very minimal. So here's the, um, see if this works. Come on, YouTube. 
Yeah. I don't know if I can. So I've already, we won't watch this for very long. We're almost done. Um, I've already done the uh, laminotomy and I just got to the dura. Uh, and to the right is the patient's head. To the left is the patient's feet. The top part is um, the midline and the bottom part is the facet. So I'm standing uh, where the facet is. Is everybody oriented? Do you see where you are? And the, um, I just I just found the, uh, I started recording when the minute I got the Dura because I thought it'd be more interesting. And then that's a curette and I'm just, there's a lot of scar here. So it just took a long time um, using the curette, the curved curette, I basically lift all the scar off of the Dura and separate the scar from the Dura. And then that's a kerosene punch and you remove the bone with the kerosene punch. And I hug, I hug the bone with the kerosene punch so that I don't tear the dura. You see that? And you can see I'm, I'm sucking for myself. Sometimes it's, I like, I prefer to suck for myself. Not that Madeline's not good. She's really good at it, but it's just easier, you know, cause I'm exactly. And I get the tactile feedback and I know exactly how to coordinate it. It's better if I do it, but then there's some angles that I just can't do it. I can't do it with one hand. I need two hands. And that's when I have, have you, um, what's that? Yeah. 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 Because the bone has a tendency to bleed in the wax. So it's a, it's just a constant, slow, methodical process of taking the pressure off the nerve roots. So we're basically done the conference. This, this goes on for a while. So any questions about anything we said? Oh, so the final, the final result is she's pain free. I saw her like two weeks out. Mm -hmm. Super happy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for now. Well in the hospital too, yeah. Yeah, she did. She's pain free. Now the question is how long will it last? I mean, I hope it lasts for the rest of her life. Yeah, and that was a that was a standard laminectomy. Mm -hmm. Uh, by like what sutures? Yeah, sutures staples. Uh, number ones, two uh, number one vicral, two of vicals, and the uh, uh, yeah dermabon. Yeah, so I don't know if I can go forwards at all. Like, the problem is with this, you can't. When you have a YouTube video, you can't go forwards. I wanted to show you further. Anyway, that's it. There's like a big piece that was particularly. Yeah. That I mean, it's it's always like that. Like when you're under the microscope, it's a totally different world. You know, like you don't, there's things that you find like really big pieces or ossified things that, that you wouldn't predict from the MRI scan because you just, everything's so magnified. It's a, it's a different perspective. It slows you down a little bit when everything is so magnified, but yet it, it allows you to be incredibly precise. So it's worth it, I think. But some surgeons don't like it because they say it slows them down because everything's so magnified. But I think I think it's worth it. It just explain to you why some people don't use the microscope. Huh? Well, some people are uncomfortable with it and they feel they're just as good without the microscope. So I don't think it's, I, I'm not critical about it, but I just it, people are opinionated. I mean, in my opinion, it's, it's worth it. All right. I think we're pretty much, we're pretty much done. So any, any questions at all? About lumbar stenosis, about yeah, scoliosis. Yeah, me too. I'm a visual learner too. All right, I think that's it. That's it. Thanks. Thanks for coming, guys. Thanks, guys, for coming. I appreciate it. Just close this. See you next month. <clears throat>